Welcome, my name is Lise Kukkonen and this is Practitioner's Viewpoint. In this series of podcasts, I will be interviewing practitioners from different fields on how they see sedentary behavior and promotion of physical activity in their work. Today, I have the honor to introduce my guest, Dr. Tom Walters. Tom completed his Bachelor of Science in Exercise Science at Montana State University and then earned a Doctoral of Physical Therapy degree at Chapman University in Southern California. Afterwards, he completed a residency in orthopedic manual physical therapy. Dr. Walters is a board-certified orthopedic physical therapist and strength and conditioning specialist. In In addition to his clinical practice, he also runs one of the world's largest social media accounts dedicated to physical rehab called at Rehab Science on Instagram. From 2012 to 2019, he served as a full-time kinesiology professor at Westmont College and taught courses including biomechanics, therapeutic exercise and pain science. So in this episode today, we are going to talk about physical activity, exercise and and its effect on some of the most common musculoskeletal problems. We will also talk about social media and the field of physical therapy. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Tom Waters. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to uh, talk about all those topics. I'm so excited that you had time to be on our show. So let's start with your professional background. How or why did you get interested in physical therapy? So what's your story? Yeah, I think uh, my story is probably similar. Having taught kinesiology for years and, you know, just watch students kind of go through this process, I think it's a similar story. Uh, basically, I was an athlete in high school and um, had an, had knee surgery and ended up in those days, you know, people were immobilized a lot longer. Uh, this was in 1996, so I was put into a straight knee brace, ended up developing a contracture, you know, significant atrophy and I hadn't really been introduced to physical therapy uh, prior to that, but ended up going because of those impairments and um, just was sort of opened up to the world of physical therapy, I think. So that natural interest um, in the musculoskeletal system in training, how our body, I was really interested prior to that in strength and conditioning and just this idea that you could transform your musculoskeletal system and that it could adapt with training. And so being uh, physical therapy, sort of going to physical therapy um, opened up this whole new world of sort of pathokinesiology to me. And, uh, you know, that really kind of set me off in that direction. So uh, what, you, what was your field of sports? I was a martial artist mainly. So I uh, okay. did taekwondo and judo and then uh, with some gymnastics sort of sprinkled in. So, yeah. Okay. And, and uh, you told about your first... Um experience in physical therapy as a patient was it uh, do you now see it as a positive experience or how do you evaluate that now yeah that's a great question nobody's asking that when i look back on it uh, i do view it as positive um, because right there are lots of talks about this on social media and i think just in the rehab world in general about right there's some really bad there's some bad sort of situations of physical therapy mm-hmm. where there's a lot of passive modalities and things like that and I ended up at that time, I think the PT was pretty good. It was mostly focused on active interventions and exercise and sort of helped me regain my quadriceps strength. And I think looking at the research now and back on what I did at that time, what I can remember, I have a positive view of it. That's great to hear because, yeah, um, yeah, 96 is quite some time ago. <laughs> things, exactly. things have changed. I it. think Sorry. I'd like to I'd like to think things have changed, but yeah, yeah. great to hear that. Yeah. So you have an incredible CV. What do you do now? Who are your clients and what are the main conditions that you consult or treat people about? Sure. Yeah, I these days I really like to treat, um, I guess, just pain disorders. Um, I shouldn't say pain disorders. I'll just say general orthopedic conditions that have a pain component to them. Uh, I don't Mm -hmm. really see many post-surgical patients anymore. Uh, At one point I was doing that when I was in other clinics, but in the setup I'm in now, I really like to just see the people who are coming in and have pain and maybe had an injury, maybe didn't, but are trying to figure out why they have that pain and how to move Mm -hmm. forward. I I like that type of um, population. So I do get some chronic pain mixed in there, but most of it is 
I think the community that I live in is a very active community. So I have a lot of people who don't rest and recover enough and just push things too hard. And so it ends up being a lot of those pains and injuries that I think are really tied to just sort of a issue with balancing uh, recovery to loading. So, but mm. I, you know, I like that. It's a, uh, I like the active population and I like, I sort of like that detective hunt of what is this pain and what are the contributing factors to it? And, and, and just even talking to people, I, my mom's a uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner. My dad's a social worker. So I grew up in a very psychosocial family. And so I really like that process of talking with people and helping them sort of explore their pain and what other factors in life besides that their musculoskeletal system might be contributing to it. Mm, it's interesting. And um, there's a lot of patients. We also deal with the same kind of patient group a lot. So I, I know what you mean. So so my next question is actually kind of like uh, related to that. You have said earlier that you love your work now more than when you got into it. So uh, what is your professional philosophy and uh, what's the reason that you like your work now more I guess people quite often get tired of what they do. So how do you comment that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, uh, I think I am more, I enjoy the academic portion of, and especially teaching that mm -hmm. side of physical therapy. I do understand practitioners getting burnt out, seeing patients all the time. I think it can take a toll on you to talk to people in pain all day long, you know? And so when I talk about, enjoying this profession more than I did when I got into it. It's really the academic side of it. I like studying it. You know, I like the information. I didn't realize when I came into this field just how much I would enjoy sort of pain science and pathokinesiology and all of that and just the interplay between anatomy, biomechanics, pain, all of those things. So, you know, I, so I, I, I am always looking to sort of strike a balance between hours of patient care and mm -hmm. sort of teaching um, hours and things like that. So, mm -hmm. but I think in general, uh, from a philosophy standpoint, I, I've definitely changed. I've been a PT for 15 years now, and I, I used to be very mechanical in my thinking about pain when I came mm -hmm. out of school and I was trained that way. And I think I've definitely shifted more. I feel like I have become more of a therapist. <laughs> okay. You, <know? laughs> you learn from your mother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I, you know, I think my philosophy just really revolves around, of course, there's still the biomechanical and those mechanical elements of rehab like they were before, but I'm maybe more holistic now in terms of thinking about uh, just the person's sleep habits and stress and nutrition and um, just how they think about pain and their injury and I just, I think I try to now, and I'm not perfect, but I try to think more about kind of that whole person and spend less time assessing their posture and things like that. Yeah. So. Maybe it's also related to that. Having more um, experience and knowledge, you can combine the things better than than when you were a young therapist in a way. And um, I, I, I think this is what the patients actually really expect from a physiotherapist. I, I myself think that when I was younger, I I tried to be really efficient and I didn't realize that um, my efficiency is maybe not so good for the patients that uh, they really want to be listened to. So so it's you have a great point there. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a huge element. I, did, I was not aware of it early on as a, a new grad. I just was, like you said, I just think I was latching onto a system. I was trying to move through lots of special tests. To I had my own goals, but I wasn't really listening to the patient's yeah. goals. Mm -hmm. So um, quite often it's said that there is a huge gap uh, between what we know and what we do when it comes to health, physical activity and exercise. So I feel that as a physiotherapist, it's my job to kind of like bridge that gap. And uh, you said that you like educating. Uh, so um, how do you how do you say that? Like, what could we do? Um, or do you feel that we need to educate people more? Do you feel that there is a there is a benefit for the clients of this education? 
What do you think about that? Yeah, in terms of exercise. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, like, yeah. Um, I mean, I think there is maybe still a place for that with some people. I think most people, you know, have a general. I think at this point in time, most people are pretty aware of the fact that they should be getting, you know, a certain amount of exercise each week. I remember I used to teach this class at Westmont that was called Fitness for Life, and they, you know, there are studies obviously looking at this where providing more education in a lot of these areas didn't actually increase adherence to exercise programs. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, and that I think is something that's changed for me as a physio as time has gone on is that I used to just give people too many exercises and just give them a lot of them. And the reality was they didn't, maybe they did a couple, but they didn't do that whole, it felt too much like homework. And yeah. so I think now I'm a little more um, aware of talking with people about what is a realistic program for you? What would that look like um, day to day? And, and oftentimes I'm only giving people, you know, two, maybe three exercises maximum and just trying to really hone in on what would, what would be the priority types of movements for them to do. And I, that's definitely been a shift for me over time. It's just really paying attention to what are people, how, and how can you work this into their day so that adherence is better? Because we, we always talk about adherence being an issue. And I think a lot of times we're just giving things to people and not thinking about how could this, how could they integrate this in their day and not make it homework? Mm, definitely. You know, so whether yeah. that's some position that they do or some activity throughout the day where they could easily just do this movement, mm. you know, this exercise. So I, I, you know, I do think the education piece obviously is huge because that I think for a lot of people, they don't understand the why doing something, mm. then they're not going to do it. So I think there is that element, but then, I feel like most people who come in to see me sort of at a base level understand why they would do the movements that it's going to help them get rid of pain and get better. And so then it's just figuring out how to integrate it more seamlessly into their day. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, what do you think are these factors that are most important to um, what are the factors that affect the way people uh, follow your guidelines or take in your suggestions. What's the most important thing? Do you get yeah. people to do what you maybe su suggest them to do? Yeah, well, and that maybe that probably does go back to that why element. I think if they are not making the connection to this movement and what I came in with, which goes back again to that whole listening to them mm. and making sure it does fit with their goals. You know, I think if that connection's not made, then of course they're gonna probably have a hunch as to why they're doing it. But I think they'll be less likely to do it if that isn't really clear. Definitely, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that one's uh, a really a, a big one. Um, and then, of course, I you know things that people might have um, maybe just in life, maybe stress or just feeling overwhelmed maybe there are those types of factors uh that come into play but i think the thing that i see at least in the population where i'm at um if it feels like homework or if it takes away from them doing the things they like to do then they're not going to do it and if they don't understand that why piece of how is this exercise going to move me closer to the goals that i have that if that isn't or maybe that anatomy and maybe that's where anatomy and things can be helpful is seeing how this movement specifically targets this thing that's bothering me. If I don't understand that, I'm going to be less likely to actually, and I, you know, and I don't see as much of that anymore. I remember when I was in a insurance based clinic and we'd see people every 20 or 30 minutes, I think there was less time to explain things and they were seeing different people in the clinic and there was more, of an opportunity for those pieces to be missed mm -hmm. and someone, you know, more likely that someone might leave and not fully understand why they're doing something. I, luckily now I see everyone just one-on-one -on -one for an hour and it, I just, I don't notice that happening as much. There's just way more conversation. And I think that's the piece mm -hmm. that's you, so helpful. So you'll have, you have time to find out the why for this person. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Um, so one of the goals of this podcast is to actually bring physical activity researchers and clinicians together. Uh, so 
As we just told, evidence supporting the benefits of sufficient daily physical activity has grown over the years. So do you talk about daily physical activity with your clients often? You already said that you have a very active uh, population coming in. So maybe you are talking about physical activity in terms of reducing it. So um, yeah, what's the, what's the case? Do you take yeah. it up with your patients? Definitely. I mean, I do not have many situations come up now where I'm at in, in trying to encourage people to get their exercise minutes daily or on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. uh, probably more of what I'm doing. Um, I have a lot of people who are very active, but don't incorporate resistance training. Okay. Enough. Yeah. And so a yeah. lot of uh, runners, trail runners, tennis, play, you know, just all these mm -hmm. different kind of sports and activities. So if I talk in this with this population, if I talk about anything related to exercise, it is that um, managing volume. So they're having some rest and recovery time and then also incorporating resistance training. I think I still have a lot of people, uh, endurance type aerobic athletes who feel that if I'm a runner, my legs are strong and that's all I need. So I think that myth is something I'm constantly trying to help sort of debunk or just in, kind of convince people, motivate them, you know, and that is tough because a lot of those athletes do not like resistance training. I think it's really boring. So do you think that, yeah. Do you think that there's also this, uh, in, in the running population that there is this fear of getting too much muscle mass or something, you know, other things? Sure. I, I do think that's, uh, that could be one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Gaining muscle mass and that decreasing your performance yeah. or changing aesthetics or something. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I don't have people. I have heard that from time to time. Uh, I just so much of it I hear is just people are just don't enjoy those exercises. Mm. so which is uh hard i enjoy them a lot so <laughs> you know whereas i don't want to run a lot so I, we're just the, okay. the flip of each other okay. but um and i have you know i mean prior to being here i did work as a traveling therapist in the u.s for a little bit in different cities and for sure even where i grew up people are much more sedentary and in those situations i remember one uh, clinic in particular we did have to spend a lot more time just trying to encourage people to move more you know, and a very sedentary population, uh, not only just talking about exercise almost felt like too far of a jump. It was just trying to get people to just walk, just do something. Just don't be so sedentary. Just get up and move more throughout your day. So, yeah, that's um, something which is like you live in a very active uh, community. But I just read, I also think that, um, you know, talking about physical activity, sometimes I think that everybody knows the guidelines and everything. But I just read some research that, that the Australian physiotherapists actually was only 10% of them uh, knew the guidelines of physical activity. And like around 50% of them were uh, suggesting people to be physically more active on average, but they didn't know the guidelines themselves. So yeah. I think that's kind of like, and in other countries, it's, it's a uh, similar to, to, to this, like the, it's similar to Australia. Uh -huh. So it was really surprising for me. So yeah. I guess uh, in a way we are also living in a bubble of, Oh, for sure. And you yeah. know, I mean, this is actually a good, well, I'll test myself here and see if I know, because I could be off too, but, um, you know, I think the last thing I remember, and I don't know what reference you use, but I think it one in the U.S. the American College of Sports Medicine. I want to say it was 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous. Yeah, Actually, correct. Is that close? Yeah. Okay, that's uh, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> but, it's, um, and, it's 150 to 300 minutes of uh, yeah moderate exercise, and then two times a week Resistance strength training, training or yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you knew it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I did teach a class where I should have been talking about it, but it's been a few years. So, um, but you know, it's those, I, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things, even where if you know the number, it's this sort of, in a way, sort of an abstract, just value, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe uh, for me, it was always helpful to kind of take that number. I think probably like a lot of people and divide it out over seven days and figure out, well, how many minutes is this action a day? I mean, it's actually when you're busy with life and work and family, kids, if you have them, it's, it can be challenging sometimes. Uh, you know, and I think this last year and a half with a lot of people being at home, it just, 
it can when you don't maybe don't have access to your gym or your normal routines it makes it mm -hmm. harder for people and you're just stressed and exercising sounds maybe to a lot of people like a piece of another thing of homework to do and you're already stressed out it's uh i see a lot of that on social media i think people struggling with sort of getting a rhythm going with exercise in this last year and a half definitely and i i think that the the pandemic year has also in a way showed us how important physical activity really is to us also for those people who maybe didn't think about it before but being in a lockdown really changes that or like shows you how important it is to sometimes go out and have a walk at least oh my gosh so. i that was very true for me uh just mental health wise i um i think i was aware of it somewhat before but i didn't realize the just how powerful it is mm -hmm. and we're very fortunate here that we have a hiking trail near our house and so i go out i did picked up a lot of trail running until i got an achilles tendinopathy um <laughs> but i was doing a lot of trail running during uh covid and it um, just getting out in nature being out you know with some sunshine and just exercising it really i would come back after those sessions and it would it would just boost my outlook you know from that time you know for until the next time i did it, it just it was really helpful i i totally agree with you on that on the trail running and also exercise <laughs> otherwise <laughs> um so just to come back with for the to the physical activity you said you have a lot of clients who are physically active maybe too active do you use any technology to like assess their physical activity or or not I don't, you know, I haven't seen, um, there hasn't some, been something I've run into. This could be another tidbit maybe I could get from you, but I haven't seen, um, I haven't used a tracker or any kind of anything like that to, that'd probably be great. I mean, as we know, having some objective data on something, mm -hmm. if, if you're not measuring it, you don't really know what's happening. And so that's a great idea actually to have people sort of log their exercise minutes Mm. And maybe activity and, um, geez, it'd be a great way, I think, for the patient to be able to look back and say, because our memory is always filled with error, I think, mm -hmm. and um, to be able to look back at something objective. And But I, I don't use anything like that right now. It's just more kind of in conversation and checking in with people. Uh, is there Are there things like that out there that exist? Uh, yeah, there is. Yes, yes, there's. There are some tools that you could use. Yes, we can definitely discuss that too later on. Yeah. But so uh, let's think that if, um, you know, if you would have a device, mm -hmm. what would you expect from that? So maybe the researchers that are listening to us sure. can have an idea. So what, as a physical therapist, what would you like to have on a yeah. device? I what think kind of information? Yeah, if I were thinking about, um, you know, some device or app or something, I think for me, a lot of it would be because I'm trying to track the volume of loading that somebody is putting on their tissue. That's mm -hmm. often what we're talking about is just managing that sort of volume. Um, I think maybe something that allowed them to input the type of activity Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it could be just something simple that had the type the type of activity uh, and then the duration that it was done for in that particular bout. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you could add all kinds of other, you know, GPS and things that could show you, were they running on hills or was it flat or, you know, I'm sure the real running specialist physios and different types like that would probably have all kinds of other input of things they would want to look at. But I think for me, I'd really be curious just in general trends, um, how much time were they spending and what was the activity? And then maybe a way to input uh, when they completed the things that we had, that I had prescribed in our sessions. Yeah. Maybe there'd be a way to say, oh, I, I went through these resistance training. These were the exercises I did them on these days, you know, yeah. something like that. Um, so quite, quite basic information, really. I don't, and, yeah. Yeah. And just to see... Um, if you have population that are too active, then to see whether, when are they getting too much physical mm -hmm. activity or kind of like, um, are the tissues getting enough rest maybe? Exactly. I mean, I think you could add sleep hours to that. You, you know, mm -hmm. there are 
it's almost like the the biometric trackers that are out now you know almost just looking at some of that data but maybe you could you could start, you know maybe you could tune it in, in a way that's a little more specific to just the physical activity but yeah it's I, I really probably should spend more time coming up with a system to look at that data <laughs> so it was make not, it more objective. <laughs> it was not my goal to <laughs> no, it's a good criticize idea. you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but um, so I think it's a good time to actually end up the first part of our podcast. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we will have a short break now, and then we will uh, continue with the second part.